Right. Well, thank you everyone for joining. Happy Bitcoin Independence Day. I have my little mimosa to uh, celebrate. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a really important day today um, for, uh, for many reasons. The first reason um, is the one that I just mentioned, um, that the amount of people that are into Bitcoin today is much, much, much bigger than the one that was the amount of people that were in Bitcoin um, on August 1st, 2017. I mean, obviously, there was the big um, Bitcoin pump, right, after, um, after SegWit got activated which started you know, somewhere around October, November 2017. And then um, you know, who knows how many more people are in Bitcoin today, but I think it's fair to say maybe 10 times more people are in Bitcoin today than at the time that SegWit was activated. So not a lot of people know this story of UASF, and it is like the foundational story of Bitcoin. I mean, there's really two big events in Bitcoin. As far as I'm concerned, it's the creation of Bitcoin and UASF, which is kind of like the... I guess uh, the confirmation of Bitcoin, if you want to say, uh, using a Catholic metaphor, you know, Bitcoin was baptized with Satoshi's um, Genesis block and then uh, the confirmation or whatever of Bitcoin's value proposition was UASF. Um, and a lot of the things that we take for granted today that, that we think of being obvious in Bitcoin are not obvious at all, um, uh, or were not obvious at all at the time of UASF. Things like, who gets to make the rules of Bitcoin, things like um, how do we upgrade Bitcoin, um, what makes Bitcoin uh, irreproducible, um, what's the difference between you know, Bitcoin and Dogecoin, right? Um, all, of these, all of these semantic, like, and who's in, who's in charge was the, main, was the main question. So who's in charge of Bitcoin was the main thing that people didn't really agree on. Um, what's the role of the miners? What is a node? You know, what is the role of the node in, in the system? Um, and another example today, you know, the phrase, you know, run your own node, it's like a catchphrase. Everybody agrees that you have to run your own node and everybody uh, is kind of uh, on the same message uh, that it's a positive thing that you, but this was definitely not the, the mainstream opinion uh, before your OSF. Um, uh, the idea that nodes mattered was highly controversial um, and the predominant belief, um, I guess in the, in the um, uh, in some circles at least was that the miners are the ones that control and the nodes are just um kind of uh, redundant and useless uh, with miners so all of these concepts that we now know today to be um self-evident uh, back in the day did not exist so it's really important that we talk about this um and that we remember this event uh i saw i was just on twitter today tweeting about it and someone tweeted something like eh, you know it was no big deal nothing changed after uasf uh, well, that's the point. <laughs> Nothing changed after USF. Everything stayed the same. Bitcoin remained pure and uncorrupted. So um, it sounds like it's not a big deal. But trust me when I tell you that for us back then, um, it was the most stressful and most um, intense moment of our lives. So um, I'm going to talk about the, the general, uh, take my notes here, just the historical context of Bitcoin, I mean, uh, of USF. So you know, just to get out of the way, UASF is the user activated soft fork. That's what it means, UASF. And um, the, the event that we're talking about is um, a, a, uh, the activation of SegWit. A USF was an activation method for SegWit for the segregated witness upgrade to Bitcoin, um, which we're going to talk about um, later. But um, it was a, 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 uh, a movement by users to um, upgrade the Bitcoin network um, without needing to compromise with the, the miners, the Bitcoin miners. Um, and uh, this is what the, the, the culmination of what we would call the Bitcoin scaling wars, which was a, uh, a very large conflict and disagreement between um, people in the Bitcoin community and industry about how to upgrade the, the, the Bitcoin protocol. But so going back to like, what is the historical context of this? I mean, okay, so historical context of Bitcoin is that before that there had never been any controversial upgrade, okay? Um, Bitcoin had had some forks. So a fork of the Bitcoin network uh, had happened, um, uh, either a soft fork or a hard fork accidentally. There had been one accidental hard fork a very, very, very long time ago that was resolved for six blocks, but there had been soft forks in Bitcoin. So the, a fork in the network is essentially um, 
when part of the network because it becomes incompatible with the other, you call that a hard fork. When you upgrade the network so that um, some of the, uh, the Bitcoin nodes are retroactively compatible and some have not upgraded but are still compatible, then that's a soft fork. So let's say that you upgrade the Bitcoin network and those who upgrade are compatible with those who don't upgrade. That's a soft fork. If you upgrade the Bitcoin network and those who upgrade are no longer compatible with those who have not upgraded, that's a hard fork. So back in the day when Satoshi was dictator of Bitcoin, um, it was very easy for Satoshi to upgrade Bitcoin. Um, and when I say he was dictator of Bitcoin, um, I really mean that. I mean, uh, if Satoshi said that we should do something, um, of course, there was peer review. Of course, there was discussions in the Bitcoin talk forum. But Satoshi said something. I mean, people just did it, right? Um, he was the, the person in charge of the, of, the, of the source code. But that's not even what mattered um, the most. I mean, he was the, um, the, the obvious leader of the, the development. And he was the visionary behind the whole thing. So it, it was quite easy um, to know what to do, just follow what Satoshi says. Um, and so I know this is probably why Satoshi left, actually, because Satoshi was obviously the single point of failure of Bitcoin at that time. So the fact that he um, disappeared and removed himself from the equation, removed you know, the central decision-making point that could have been corrupted. Um, can imagine the catastrophe if someone had been able to successfully pretend they are Satoshi and, uh, and, uh, uh, and people had believed them. For example, if someone had a uh, uh, taken over his, you know, Bitcoin talk handle and said that we should remove privacy from Bitcoin or something like that, um, it would have been a catastrophe. So, uh, basically take, take control of Bitcoin, right? Change the rules and also change the transaction history and also inflate the money. Um, so, uh, Anything that makes it more difficult to run a Bitcoin full node is an attack on Bitcoin's decentralization, for sure. Right? That's, that's no doubt. Um, it's already difficult to run a Bitcoin full node. Like Literally, most people will like buy physical full nodes because it's complicated already um, to run a full node. So anything that makes that even more complicated is a threat to the decentralization of Bitcoin, Bitcoin's censorship resistance, Bitcoin's immutability, and Bitcoin's scarcity. So obviously extremely crucial. Uh, the second thing um, that wasn't a big concern at the time, but it is now for sure, we know that, is that if you're doing a hard fork, some people will be left on the old chain and will no longer be compatible with Bitcoin. It is impossible that everyone will upgrade, right? So let's say that you say, all right, uh, we're gonna hard fork Bitcoin. In one year, the blocks are two megabytes. And if you don't upgrade, you're no longer on the Bitcoin network, right? Let's say that you bought Bitcoin before the fork and you just forget about them. And 10 years later, you boot up your Bitcoin core and you send to someone and it says, nope, your Bitcoins are no longer valid here. What the fuck? Like, I, I, you know, as a Bitcoin seller, I was selling Bitcoin. I'm still selling Bitcoin. I can't, when I sell Bitcoin to someone, they are buying into a certain set of rules. And if we change that set of rules, we're defrauding them, we're, we're, we're scamming them, right? They didn't buy the Bitcoin with two megabyte blocks, they bought the Bitcoin with one megabyte block. And it is impossible to coordinate a hard fork that will be 100% upgraded. For sure, someone will be left behind. And who are we to make that decision? Bitcoin is not a democracy, right? You cannot make a decision that will kick someone out of the network Therefore, as radical as it sounds, there will never be a hard fork in Bitcoin. Never, ever, ever. Um, if there is a hard fork in Bitcoin, the new thing is not Bitcoin. It doesn't matter if 99.999% of people on earth call the new thing Bitcoin, it is not Bitcoin objectively, right? So you can't fork Bitcoin because the result of the fork would not be Bitcoin. So like, think about it again. You cannot fork Bitcoin because if you fork Bitcoin, the result is not Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is not hard forkable, right? Um, so two reasons why we didn't want to increase the block size. Um, and uh, what is the solution that we were proposing to this? Well, the Lightning Network. The, Lightning Network, the second layer solution, that was one. Uh, and then the Bitcoin Core scaling roadmap was twofold. You have the second layers, 
So sidechains and Lightning Network. And then you have the optimizations um, to make basically the, the, the block size, the, the Bitcoin core people are saying, hey, like we don't have to change the block size. We can make the transactions more efficient so we can fit more transactions. The analogy was very simple back in the day. It was like, instead of, you know, uh, instead of like making the highway lanes, adding another highway lane, um, we can just fit people into buses, for example. Like, let's, let's, let's make the cars more compact. Let's use the existing highway lanes more efficiently um, because right now there's, you know, everybody's like big free for all. So um, uh, let's, let's make the, the transactions more efficient so we can fit more of them in each block. Um, let's mitigate the, the fee uh, problems with smarter fee algorithms. Let's, let's optimize as much as we can. And then once the base layer is optimized and we keep that intact, we do second layer solutions with Lightning. Um, Lightning was not possible uh, at the time uh, because there was no SegWit. Um, SegWit was fixing something called the malleability bug in Bitcoin, um, which, yeah, I think my mic, I'm gonna try not to squeeze too much. Um, so SegWit was fixing what's called the malleability bug in Bitcoin, um, a complicated, bug but um overall the general idea is that um it was like bitcoin's core like bitcoin's main kind of technical flaw um was this bug which in some cases allowed people to cheat the bitcoin rules and double spend and and something like that i'm not moving at all guys i can't move less so if i'm bothering you you're gonna you're gonna have to, <laughs> to to deal with it i really can't move less than this um uh so uh so SegWit was a solution because it fixes the mailability bug, which allows uh, the Lightning Network um, to, uh, to exist. Also, um, seg with SegWit, we were able to create this very niche and uh, kind of like a little hack um, where we don't increase the block size by 2x, but we, the, the size of the transactions count less. It's really hard to explain, but basically a transaction that was, was 100 and let's say 200 kilobytes is now going to be counted as 100 bytes, kilobytes, sorry. And the other 100 kilobytes is gonna be the witness part, um, which is not counted in the block size by the miner. So even if there's, even if the block size is bigger, the miner counts it in a different way so that it's not breaking the one megabyte limit. <laughs> it's kind of a hack, but it's like, instead of changing the block size, we're just gonna change the way that we count the block size, uh, which is what SegWit did. Uh, it, it, it wasn't necessary to do that, but that was the first compromise that the Bitcoin Core developers did was to discount the SegWit transaction so that a SegWit transaction, yes, someone is saying, uh, it's now called the block weight, exactly. So the block weight is the, uh, basically the, um, uh, like there's a transaction size and then you apply the SegWit discount and uh, the block weight will be the total weight, so uh, the total size. So what's, what used to be the size? So like you'll see a block right now, it's gonna be two megabytes in weight. So there's two megabytes worth of transactions in it instead of one. So Bitcoin blocks today have two X, a little bit more than two X capacity um, without hard forking, just with SegWit than before, um, before SegWit. So the idea of SegWit Interestingly enough, is born in Montreal. Um, at the time, Blockstream had its office in Montreal. There was a Bitcoin scaling uh, conference in Montreal. All sorts of stuff starts to happen there. And um, at the Bitcoin scaling Hong Kong conference, which was in late December 2015, um, Peter Willey, the uh, one of the co-founders of Blockstream and one of the you know legends of Bitcoin Core, um, announces segregated witness and immediately it's like, oh, whoa, like everybody's mind is blown and it's like the best thing since sliced bread and this is gonna fix malleability. It's gonna make Lightning Network possible. It's gonna make the blocks heavier without hard forking. Um, it's just the greatest thing ever. Um, however, SegWit is gonna be a hard fork. So bad, not good. Um, a little bit later, there's this very historic conversation between Luke Jr. and a guy called Eric Lombroso. Um, I, have a, I have a screenshot of it. Unfortunately, the actual conversation was deleted from the Bitcoin IRC chat because the Bitcoin IRC servers were taken down because of GDPR, unfortunately. But I have a screenshot of that conversation where 
you know, people are, are discussing the fact that, you know, SegWit is great, but you have to do a hard fork to get it. And then Luke Jr., this Bitcoin developer, he's just like, oh, no, I, you can totally do this as a hard fork. And they're like, what do you mean? You totally cannot do that as a hard soft fork. And he's like, oh, yeah, you definitely can. And he comes up with this, like, crazy idea. And I'm not going to explain it, but this, this, this concept. And people are like, holy shit. We can do this as a soft fork. We don't have to fork the network. We don't have to worry about all of these crazy problems that are going to happen with forking the network and all these ethical dilemmas. We can soft fork SegWit. We can solve the scalability problem, or you know, we can start solving, you know, part a big part of the scalability problem. Everybody's going to be happy. Let's do it. So they code SegWit, the Bitcoin Core developers, and then for about a year, the whole 2016 year. There was a lot of, um, let's call it, uh, uh, community outreach. Like I was personally, you know, asked by the developers, is this something you want, blah, 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 blah. And then there is no opposition to SegWit. That's very important. Like, there is no opposition to SegWit whatsoever at all. So the opposition will be how to activate SegWit, but there's no one really serious in the, in the industry that's saying SegWit is bad for Bitcoin. Like this technology, we do not want it. We don't want this upgrade. Um, perhaps one person, right, um, or two, but let's say that let's say you have a, a thousand businesses and experts, you'll have 995 of those thousand that are like, obviously SegWit is the way to go. Um, so um, the, uh, the, the uh, SegWit uh, upgrade is scheduled to be updated in the Bitcoin core. So the Bitcoin core developers, they don't decide, their job is not to decide what goes into Bitcoin. Their job is to receive the consensus from the users. The users want SegWit. They want this capacity increase. They want to fix malleability. They want lightning, right? We give the mandates to the devs. We want these things. You code it and put it in Bitcoin core. Um, so they do, right? And their job is finished, uh, should have been finished. Uh, because once the, uh, the, the, the upgrade is put into Bitcoin Core, it should be uh, adopted and then uh, by the network, and then we're done. However, the method by which we were activating soft forks at the time was called minor signaling, right? So basically, when, you, when the, the core developers release the upgrade, everybody needs to be coordinated at the same time. That's the, that's the problem. Like, we need to upgrade at the same time. Um, not everyone needs to upgrade, but all of the miners need to upgrade. Okay, I'm important. Not all of the users in a soft fork, not all of the users need to upgrade, but all of the miners need to upgrade, right? Because if the miner creates a SegWit incompatible block, his block will be rejected. So as users, the miners work for us. They're producing block space that they're selling to us for fees and inflation. We buy it from them. So they work for us. However, we're not assholes, right? Like we understand that the miners have made a lot of investment in their hardware, a lot of uh, investment in their business. And if one day to the next, we, we don't give them enough time to upgrade and create the blocks that we want, then they're going to get screwed. They're going to create blocks that we're not going to be buying and they're going to be losing the money that they put into the electricity that they put into the block. And the more miners lose money because we refuse their blocks, the more tempted they would be to create an altcoin and salvage that electricity they've already put into those Bitcoin blocks by forking Bitcoin. So it's in everybody's best interest to coordinate that and make sure that we're all, at the, um, we're all uh, on the same page. So we create this thing. It says, OK, so we're going to let the miner signal for when it's ready, when you're ready. So when you're ready, put this little code into the Bitcoin block. And then our nodes will start to activate SegWit once we see that enough miners are ready. It's a very nice thing to do, right? We are very nice towards the miners. We give them this tool so that they can tell us when they're ready um, to ensure that they don't lose money. Very, very kind from the Bitcoin developers and users. But then these fucking assholes, <laughs> um, they, uh, they, see, they see this. Uh, this power to activate SegWit and 
truly, genuinely, I don't think a lot of people thought that there would be a problem. Um, so we launched SegWit, and then immediately, you know, a few mining pools start to mine it. There's 20, 25 percent of the network that's like on SegWit, and then it just stops moving. Like, no one is upgrading to SegWit. Months go by. Months go by. You know, we're trying to contact the Chinese miners. Like, what the fuck, guys? Like, what's going on? Like, you know, just upgrade your software. What's the what's the issue here? And then I think they realized that they had power over the network, and what kind of a, of a fool uh, would not exercise power of a Bitcoin if he could? You know, it's like the, the ring, you know, the, the one ring in the Lord of the Rings, you know, the, 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 the man is like, oh, I'll keep the ring and I'll use it for the good, you know? I won't use it for, I won't use it. Of course, they're going to use it, right? They're going to use the power that they have over the network. So they decide that they want more fees. Uh, and they want bigger blocks. They want, they want the network to be forked in half. Um, uh, they want the network to be forked. They want to increase the block size. Um, they, uh, they're not opposed to SegWit, but they want bigger blocks. And the community of users did not want, the developers certainly did not want bigger blocks because for, it is a dangerous thing to put into the Bitcoin core software. If you code in the Bitcoin Core software a hard fork, you are guaranteeing user loss of funds. It's important to understand that if you, if you, as a Bitcoin developer, if you put a hard fork into the Bitcoin Core software, you are guaranteeing with 99.99999999% certainty that someone will lose money because of your decision. It wasn't their decision to make. The Bitcoin Core developers do not want to do that. And then the Bitcoin community does not want to do that. And then... Nothing's happening. The 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 SegWit upgrade is not is not is not uh, uh, is not happening. And then the other Bitcoin Core developers that were there, bef you know, um, a bit earlier, Gavin Andreessen and Jeff Garzik, out of nowhere, they release a fork of Bitcoin that does exactly what the miners wanted. What a big coincidence! Um, and they increase the Bitcoin block size to 20 megabytes. At, um, uh, so 20x. So the Bitcoin blockchain is now 20x bigger. Uh, every uh, every block. And that was kind of like out of nowhere, like what the fuck? So they release this this a new suggestion, and then they start lobbying for it. Start lobbying for it uh, aggressively. Uh, they they actually go to China by airplane. Um, I, I know this because I knew people that were part of their delegation. They literally go knock on the miners' door, and they say, "Hey, fuck you know, fuck Bitcoin Core and fuck these guys, fuck the cypherpunks." Um, let's fucking take over Bitcoin, basically, because if you know uh, they are the developers of this new software, if the miners accept this new software and people move to this software, then the old Bitcoin core team is kicked out. De facto, they become the Bitcoin developers um, uh, that are uh, influential because none of the these Bitcoin developers, Garzik and and Andreessen specifically, are involved anymore uh, because they are technically too, uh, I guess, too inferior uh, to keep up with shit like SegWit and Schnorr signatures and all that kind of stuff, which the new developers are much better at. So they, they are fighting for relevance, uh, is my psychological interpretation, uh, I would say. So they launch this thing, they go, uh, and then, holy fuck, the miners start to mine that fucking shit. And uh, we're just like, oh, oh you just, what the? What the fuck? What? What? So, you know, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30%, 35% hash rate goes to this thing called Bitcoin Unlimited. And I'm just fucking freaking the fuck out. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck is going on? You guys can be serious. This is, this is garbage. This is bullshit. Um, so before UASF was the anti-Bitcoin Unlimited, right? Uh, so we start to lobby against Bitcoin Unlimited. Uh, while SegWit is there. So it's like SegWit versus Bitcoin Unlimited. Like both are like fighting against another. Um, and it's kind of like a hash power. We're like stuck in the mind frame of a hash power war. And then at this point, we're kind of like, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Like we are getting sucked into this thing. We were getting sucked into whoever has the highest hash power wins. And, and I'm like, I didn't sign up for no fucking democracy. Like, nobody gets to vote on what's Bitcoin. Like, Bitcoin is Bitcoin. Bitcoin Core is Bitcoin. My Bitcoin is the Bitcoin that's compatible with Satoshi. If Satoshi wants to send me money, 
my node will accept that as a valid payment. I'm sorry. Like, Satoshi doesn't need to upgrade in order to send me money. Right? I must be always compatible with his original coins. That's how I know I'm on the right Bitcoin blockchain because all of the coins so far in history are compatible with me. BU would have completely changed that. So no fucking way we're doing this thing. So people start to organize. And then um, uh, we actually in Canada have this thing. We, we, we got like all the Bitcoin businesses, like not all, but most. And we like signed this thing uh this like a uh, memo and we're like fuck this we're never gonna we're never gonna go on to bitcoin unlimited it's not bitcoin um you know bitcoin core is bitcoin right um but then there's a there's a block right so this block lasted for i might be confused with the dates but i think it lasted for about like a year right where it's like bu bitcoin unlimited and segwit like are kind of like locked into this hash war and nothing is happening and it's clear that like nothing isn't gonna happen, and people are like, "Oh well, is this a stalemate forever?" Right? Um, and then you uh, you had uh, the the business people at the time. Uh, we were exiting a bear market, right? So you have all of these companies: Coinbase, Bitpay, Blockchain Info, the three big tra traders to Bitcoin: Coinbase, Bitpay, Blockchain Info. Um, but many others, but in terms of treason, theirs is the most um, uh, shapeshift also. Uh, but, you know, those four, I would say, they're, they're saying, oh, well, there's not enough people on Bitcoin because the Bitcoin core developers have limited the block size. So we're not making money because the Bitcoin core developers are radical ideologues that care more about the cypherpunk ideology than they care about adoption. This is the narrative that's emerging. And those companies are, are and you know, I'm, I'm telling this story, but you have to understand this is from my point of view as being someone that was talking to those people. Like they were all my friends and I would meet them in person, like these CEOs of these companies and stuff. But I, I can definitely attest to the mentality being Bitcoin is not growing as fast as we predicted. Why? Well, it's not because this, it's because the developers have capped it at one megabyte and they are keeping Bitcoin behind for crazy neck beard. They, they were very dismissive and, and contemptuous as painting us as radical fat fuck fucks in their basement that don't give a shit about business, right? And they are the smart ones that got all the VC money and that are creating the products so that they should be the ones who decide, not the radical cypherpunk ideologues. That is the way that this thing is shaping up. Um, and, um, and uh, they are, are, uh, are saying, well, it's very simple. You know, you guys don't want SegWit. You guys want the bigger blocks. How about we fucking do both? And we're like, no, it doesn't work like that because we, you know, if we do both, we still get the hard fork that we don't want to do. But their idea is like to package that thing. Uh, you know, they think in terms of business deals. They don't think in terms of emergent order and spontaneous governance. Uh, their whole mindset is, the, you know, uh, diplomacy and they, they cannot cope with the fact that this network runs by itself and they're not in charge. Possibly because when they raised money, they were telling their, their investors also that they are big players and they can contribute to deciding. It's a big pitch for Bitcoin companies at the time, like I'll become a big player and I'll get to decide where Bitcoin is heading. Um, that's how they were justifying their absence of revenue basically and hundreds of millions of VC money or some sh whatever. Um, but not on the same page at all with us. And then, um, and then uh, uh, it appears that uh, they want to do this thing, this travesty called Segwit2x. So I was part of the early discussions. This started in January 2017. It, uh, Eric Voorhees from Shapeshift and a bunch of other um, Bitcoin CEOs are like, they have this private email list and they're like, let's do both. Let's do Segwit. And so we will, uh, uh, basically they were caving into the miners, right? And when I'm talking about miners, I'm strictly speaking of the Chinese roundtable, they used to call it. And the Chinese roundtable was an association of uh, Bitmain via BTC and a, a, a few of the big, uh, of the big um, Chinese Bitcoin miners that were acting as a unified block that represented something around 75% of the Bitcoin hash rate at the time, or maybe even close to, to, to 80. I think the only ones that were not part of that cabal uh, was... Um, uh, Bitfury and Slush are the two ones that remained 
um, on the, the light side of the force. Um, so they want us to do this compromise and, uh, and we're like, fuck that shit. And then, okay, then you're never going to get SegWit and this is the end of Bitcoin. And I was actually in the mindset like, well, fuck it. You know, even if Bitcoin doesn't scale, I would rather have an unscaled Bitcoin than a soiled, tainted, stained, politicized, 2x size Bitcoin. Um, so depression. <laughs> no, no, everybody's pretty sad. And then, fuck, this guy, Sheldon Fry, out of nowhere, he's a Litecoin developer, and he, uh, he says, hey, actually, what about fuck the 95%? And 95% was the threshold of the miners. He says, what about fuck the 95% threshold, and we just do like Satoshi used to do? Satoshi used to just say, hey, if you update to Bitcoin on this date, the upgrade will be come into effect. And if you're not on the network at this date, then you're out of the network. But the Bitcoin core developers did not want to do that because they, first of all, that was a risky move and Bitcoin core developers will never do something that can put users at risk. And USF certainly did put users at risk. Um, so he created a clone of Bitcoin, a fork of Bitcoin, not a fork of the network, a fork of Bitcoin core, because just so, we, just so we're clear, the full node is Bitcoin core, but you can have your own full node. There's another one called Bitcoin Knots that I actually use. I use Bitcoin Knots for some projects. There's um, Bcoin, there's BTCD, there's other types of Bitcoin protocol and uh, 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 clients, nodes, but they're all in the same, it's the same protocol. So they're all compatible with each other. So UASF was a fork of Bitcoin Core that was implementing a specific thing in it, which said basically by August 1st, if you're not signaling for SegWit, I will consider your blocks to be invalid. Boom! You know, it's like, here's a new rule, fuckers. You want to play this game? Here's a new rule. If you don't signal for SegWit, your block's invalid. And I'm not going to accept it. Okay. So that's cool, right? But people need to opt into that for that to have any effect. So, so Shalin Fry releases UASF. He's like, well, if you guys want, you can run the software and then those who are running the software will reject the blocks of the miners. So that's where it gets interesting because you have this thing and then it only works if enough people are integrating it because the miner, this is basically blackmail. It's not exactly blackmail. It's definitely blackmail. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not exactly blackmail, but it's kind of like uh, a lot of pressure, right? Saying, hey, like if 10% of people don't accept are running UASF, for example, if 10% of the Bitcoin buyers, for example, are running UASF, that means that when you create a... So after August 1st, this is the date that we chose, right? Within the software, it's you guys have until August 1st, to start signaling for SegWit. Otherwise, bye-bye. We're not going to accept your blocks as valid. And you're going to be, technically speaking, they, they would have been on the original Bitcoin and we would have been on Bitcoin fork. If, even, even if it's a soft fork and it's still compatible, in the time in which we, the incompatibility was, because like we, it's all the users are compatible, but the miners are not compatible with the, uh, with the USF clients. So as I said before, like a soft fork, all the miners have to upgrade, um, whereas a, and the users don't have to upgrade all of them. But why would the miner upgrade? They don't have any incentive to upgrade. So we made an incentive for them to upgrade, which is we will fork off and consider your blocks to be invalid. So we were essentially threatening to fork Bitcoin, basically, right? That was the, the, general, um, the general gist of that, but with a soft fork, okay? It's getting a bit complicated, but um, the idea was if you don't follow the users, we will uh, consider your blocks to be invalid. And the miners would have been the ones that were rejecting the consensus because the consensus, again, was everybody agreed that SegWit was good, just disagreed on the activation method. So SegWit itself, was universally desired by the Bitcoin users, although USF as an activation method was not, was not at all. A lot of the Bitcoin core developers were very upset or not necessarily upset, but they were not part of the USF um, effort at all. Um, 
So shelling fry starts this thing. And then we realized that, OK, so now that the software is out there, everybody needs to run it. right? And it's, it's not easy to run like your own Bitcoin core node. Hence why today we know how, why it's important to run the Bitcoin core node. Because when we try to get people to run UASF, they're like, well, I don't, run UA I don't even run a node. So I can't. The only way to opt into UASF was not only running a node, but running a special UASF node. Um, so uh, then we, so we start to run UASF. And it, what was interesting at the time is people start to look at the stats again, the node count. How many nodes are running UASF? 10, 15, 20, 100, 200, 300, 400. As you can tell which nodes are running UASF. And then still in the fucking democracy mindset, like, oh, well, you know, Bitcoin Core is 2,000 nodes, UASF is 300 nodes, and then Bitcoin Limited is 1,000 nodes. And it's like, yeah, and then, you know, Roger is backing the Bitcoin Unlimited, right? Roger Ver. So he fucking whips up AWS data center and poof, out of nowhere, there's like a thousand Bitcoin Unlimited nodes that are all in. So, ha, ha you see, we have a thousand nodes. And, and, and we're like, no, this is not, you're, you're, you're not getting it. Like, it's not a democracy. It has nothing to do with democracy. What's going to happen is that we are going to either accept or reject the blocks of the miners. And if we make the miner lose enough money, he will cave in. It's, you see, there is no compromise here, right? It is a game of chicken. You know, in a game of chicken, you have two cars that are going like this, and the, one of them has to swerve at the end, right? This is the, this is the game of chicken. This is USF. Poof, you know, one of them has to swerve, move first. Basically, what the, the, the compromise idea is like, hey, let's just like slow down and crash a bit slower, you know, agree to slow down or something. Like, no, no, no. It's like either, either, either we, either we, we die or we fucking win. There's, there's no other, there's, there's no other scenario here. It's, it's victory or death. There's no middle ground. Um, that was the UASF philosophy, and it was based. And just side note, Nassim Taleb had just published his article the intolerant minority, which later became a chapter of the book Skin in the Game. And amongst the UASF community, this was widely, widely shared. Uh, and we used that as the guiding strategic principle of UASF, which was, um, for example, uh, uh, the example that Nassim Taleb was using in the article was that all of the orange juice in the USA is kosher even though like only like 2% of the population is Jewish or something. Why? It's because 98% of people don't mind have kosher. Kosher orange juice is a soft fork. You guys get it? Like kosher orange juice is a soft fork, right? Only 2% of people may want the kosher part, but still the same orange juice compatible with previous, with non-kosher orange juice for the other 98%. Um, so we were that 2% that said, fuck you, like, we're not even drinking orange juice if it's not kosher. Um, and if you're an orange juice producer, you have two choices. Either you make it kosher or you lose the sales. And what we were saying is, like, we will not make it 2%. We will make it fucking 15, 20, 30%. And bills, for example, my bill, my bill payment company starts to say, hey, I will not accept... For all the bill payments in Canada, I will not accept non-segwit blocks. So if you're a miner and you're using bills to pay your electricity because you don't have a bank account and you rely on bills for your everyday business because you're accepting payments, you have to go to a mining pool that is segwit compatible. Otherwise, I will not accept your bitcoins. You will not be able to use bills. So I'm, I was telling my clients, you have no choice. Either you're... And that's where they started to like get confused, those business people, they're like, but you're going to lose clients. You have to listen to the market. Listen to the market. Fuck the market. You know, fuck the market. I'm not going to fucking sell or buy corrupted, politicized Bitcoin. If there is no market for what I'm selling, I'm not going to change what I'm selling. I'm going to just go out of business and, I don't know, work on PGP or something. That was like the, the, the thing. So other people start to do it. And this is why the hats were so important, right? Because it was like a big game theory thing where if, and what's important is like, if you jump on UASF and you accept UASF payments, 
and it happens that not, no one else accepts them, then you're basically accepting a shitcoin. And then at some point, we would have actually had to drop UASF because we would have made too many losses, right? So um, the first person to accept UASF is having a very high risk. The second person to accept UASF has a lower risk than the first person. The third has an even lower risk than the second person. So the more people jump on UASF, the less likely you were to lose money by using UASF, right? It's kind of like, imagine there's another analogy that I like. It's imagine that there's like 100 people lined up against a cliff. They're on a cliff side, right? And if, you, if one person jumps, then the cliff is 100 meters. If two people jump, the cliff is 98 meters. If three people jump, the cliff is 97 meters. So if you're jumping first, if the other 99 don't jump right after you, you're heading for a very, very, very big fall. So when you jump first, you have to trust that the other people will also jump after you. It's a big leap of faith. It's kind of like the prisoner's dilemma, right, in game theory, um, where if, if you haven't, I'm not going to explain it, but it's kind of like the prisoner's dilemma in game theory. So, but, but you don't know if the other guy is going to jump after you've jumped, if, you know, be, before you've jumped. So that's why the hats were so important. The hat was the thing where I'm going to jump. I am going to jump. And if I don't jump, I'm a fucking traitor and hate me forever. And I'm banned from, uh, you know, once you put the hat on and you say you're going to do it, you have to do it. You have to commit to do it. And if you commit to do it and you don't do it, you're a fucking traitor. You're a piece of shit. That was literally, the, it was a massive, like, self, basically saying, like, holding yourself accountable. We, had, we needed to hold each other accountable on social media because there was no other way to get that confidence that we were going to do it. So that's why people started to do hashtag UASF in their Twitter handle. That's why there was all this branding and marketing and all the military. Uh, you guys might remember all the memes that are there, like the military memes or in the trenches. It was like a, the, the trench warfare meme. Um, so creating this image in the head of the miner, which is these guys are fucking nuts. Right? These guys are, 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 are radical and they will blow themselves up. Um, and the business people are like flipping out because they're like, okay, so we got the Chinese cartels on one side and then we got the radical USF people on the other side and they needed to pick a side, essentially. They needed to pick a side. There is no other option, right? Either you jump on USF or you don't. And either you jump on the fork or the hard fork, the 2X fork that they were trying to do, the, the, the miners, or you don't. Um, so we start to put a lot of pressure. We have this Bitcoin course private Slack channel, USF website, conferences all over the place. And a lot of us, Samson from Blockstream, Rodolfo from Colcard, Mr. Huddle. Um, there's so many more people like Ragnar, uh, if you know Ragnar from Twitter. Um, uh, there, there's, there's, I would say our group was about 150 to 100 to 150 guys, um, which represented maybe like 30, Slush Pool was a big component of that too, Trezor guys. Um, we have this, uh, this coordination group where we go to every conference, we make a USF speech, private dinners, shaking hands, convincing everyone like we need to do this. But most importantly, convincing them it is going to happen. It's not we should do this. It's hey, it is going to happen. Would you rather be on my chain or Bitmain's chain? In Canada, we just completely kind of like nailed it where we're like, hey, Bitcoin ETMs, bills, and a few Bitcoin exchanges were like, we're going on UASF. The, the, like maybe we're like, I don't know, seven companies or like about, you know, half of the volume in Canada, half of the transaction volume in Canada was going to go on UASF. So that was a good selling point to the other Canadian businesses. It's like, if you want to do business in Canada, it's either like, you know, you're going to have to go through UASF or you're going to have to go, you know, do, someone's going to have to replace us basically in the ecosystem, which is really difficult. So, um, that lasted from March 2017 um, until like uh, the big, big, big moment was the uh, consensus conference in June, um, consensus or end of May, where all of the USF advocates kind of met at consensus. And we had a Blockstream organize a private party for the Bitcoin Core 
enthusiasts. And, you know, it was very rah-rah. It was really like, you know, 150, 200 people with the hat, you know, it's like, fucking, let's go, like, it's do or die. And all of us came together. It was a really fantastic moment. And then the next day, the Bitcoin VCs and uh, mining the, what's called the, uh, uh, fuck, the Shanghai consensus or whatever, is like the, 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 the Bitcoin mining cartel from China's one delegate um, come up with Bitcoin 2x. SegWit plus the fork. They finally do the proposal, and that is their answer to UASF. Because they're pussies, but because uh, Bitmain, Jihan, had uh, said, well, if you do UASF, I will do UAHF. So if you guys think you're going to scare me with your user-activated soft fork, well, guess what? If you guys do your user-activated soft fork, I'm going to do my own hard fork as a threat. And what did that hard fork become, by the way? Bcash. That's Bcash. Bcash was the threat that Jihan was waving to keep his power over Bitcoin, right? So the pussies, I mean, the VC, VCs are um, listening to that and they're like, oh my God, I'm so terrified of the Chinese miners because in their stupid heads, um, the, uh, the miners were the ones in control of Bitcoin, right? So if you wanted to play, you needed to respect the, the wishes of the miners, which is such a weird mindset anyway. I don't understand that at all, but that's what they thought. Um, so, uh, so they jump on this thing and they sign this agreement. It's called the New York Agreement because it was in New York at the New York Consensus Conference uh, by Barry Silbert. And then they pledge themselves to do this 2x fork. And, ah, heartbroken. You know, everybody at the conference, the night before, you know, the cyberpunks are like, rah, rah. And then we go to the next morning and, like, every, every like, everybody's like, what the fuck? Like, you know, we go see our friends at the other companies and be like, what the fuck did you just do? You know, Ledger had signed it. We gave Ledger such a big amount of crap. It was unreal. And, like, um, I think... Uh, Bitstamp had signed it, gave them a bunch of crap. Uh, a few of the, you know, a few nice people had signed it because they didn't realize, I think, really what was, you know, what was going on. They were just like, oh well, it's, oh, oh, of course I'm going to be part of the list of very important companies that's signing this very important paper. Uh, you know, that was kind of the, the mentality there. Um, and then we're like, okay, well, you know, this is war, um, and. Uh, all into the USF, and then everyone's expecting the split to happen on August 1st. Everyone is expecting two Bitcoins to appear. And then I have some tweets where I'm like, you know, there's no more negotiation. There's no talking left to be done, right? Everything's been, been said. Let's wait for August 1st, show the fucking cards, see what's what, you know, see, see what's balls, right? It's like, you know, it's the, the, the chicken race is like, we're kind of like, you know, like motors are running, but now we have to actually go, right? So we go, and then... Luckily, this guy called James Hilliard um, comes up with a very interesting fork of Bitcoin, uh, BIP, BIP91, which said that you can, at the same time, signal for SegWit2x and UASF. So UASF was scheduled for August 1st, and then the 2x fork was scheduled for November 1st. Um, so uh, our... Our, our fork, our split, wasn't a, our split would have happened way before the 2x split was also going to happen. Um, so he did this patch to UASF, which meant that you can say that you will do the SegWit 2x, because they signed an agreement with the miners, and they told the miners, hey, we will sign SegWit 2x, but please don't fork Bitcoin on August 1st. Can you imagine like being that weak-minded and like being that much of a traitor? I, I don't know. But um, anyway, uh, you hey Jihan, please uh, don't fork, don't fork because you decide right. So don't fork, and then if you promise to not fork, we will sign this agreement that will that says that we will fork on November first, um, which was hilarious because obviously. They weren't going to do that. M many of them weren't, but 
they had you had to choose between UASF and Segwitrex. It was not possible to do both at the same time. So there was a choice to be made Unpl until this one guy, James Hilliard, the hero of Bitcoin, like the, the, the knight that we didn't expect, says, hey, actually, if you do the code this way, you can do both. You can signal for UASF. So you will activate UASF on August 1st, but also signal at the same time for Segwit2x. So this is what he proposed. And it was the face saving exit for everyone where they would comply to UASF and still believe that on November 1st, they would also get their 2x as well. Um, so everybody jumps on board with BIP91 because at the end of the day, um, you had too much, too many companies were refusing the non-UASF chain. But it was a huge bluff, right? So I'll say it three years later, none of the companies that were running UASF would have survived. It was a massive bluff, massive bluff. Um, even us, like we would have, bills would have just went bankrupt, right? Because uh, if I'm sure, sure, sure that we would have been accepting UASF coins and, um, uh, and not be able to sell them for fiat. Like we need to pay bills, right? We, bills users send us a Bitcoin, we need to pay bills. So if I receive UASF coins, I need to find a USF buyer, but the exchanges were not UASF uh, compatible. So huge fucking bluff, um, but it worked because we had the hats. Um, and I'm not even joking, right? It worked because we had military hats on everywhere we went, constantly putting in people's mind that we were fucking going to do it, going to, it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. And then eventually they believed it, right? It was going to happen. We were going to go down, they were going to win, but the resolve was so strong from a game theory point of view, it was much safer for them to go with our consensus than to risk the fork, right? So they had more to lose from going against USF than to gain. Specifically, what tipped the scales was this, this thing where you could signal both USF and for Segwit2x, which allowed people to save face um, uh, in their diplomatic efforts while still supporting USF. So BIP, BIP91, if you're already running UASF, you don't need to upgrade to BIP91. And if you are a signatory of the New York Agreement and you, ha and you have pledged to upgrade, then running BIP91 is respecting that pledge. You, will also, you are at the same time signaling USF and, and, and Segwit2x. Um, so BIP91 activates, gets more than 95, and the miners agree to BIP91. Um, so the miners capitulate. Uh, they run BIP91. On July 20th, BIP91 gets uh, activated, and it activates Segwit de facto. But on August 1st, Segwit is activated via USF. So BIP, like, it's like BIP91 activates UASF, which activates Segwit. Um, so on August 1st, we realize that we've won. Uh, USF activates Segwit. The miners are creating Segwit blocks. Segwit's compatible. And um, what, that, what that story, so USF was a bit of a clusterfuck. It was definitely rock and roll. Let's not do that again. Um, we will do user activated soft forks in the future for every single time. So the idea of minor voting has been eliminated. Um, what we have now in the future upgrades like Taproot, the next one's coming, most likely we're gonna have to take out the hats again because again, Taproot, non-controversial, will make Bitcoin go to the moon, will make Bitcoin on fucking steroids, but someone will refuse it. Someone will, someone that doesn't like more privacy into Bitcoin will oppose it. Um, so the, 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 the trick that we're going to do is something called BIP9, which is a combination of miner signaling and UASF, which is, hey, you miners, because again, if it's a soft fork, what really matters is that the miners upgrade because the users can upgrade and still be compatible with the other users who haven't upgraded, but the miners need to upgrade again. So we give you like, let's say 18 months of signaling to reach 95%. And 
after 18 months, UASF, whichever is the, fa the sooner. So if, you know, 95% of the miners signal next month, we get taproot in a month. If the miners don't signal for a year and a half, it's fine. We can uh, uh, just UASF uh, in 18 months. Also important to note, very big part of the dynamics is that SegWit allows you to signal for different soft forks at the same time. But before SegWit, you could only do one at a time. So SegWit had like been programmed for 18 months, I think, the 95% voting, but you had to wait the full 18 months in, in order to be able to do another proposal. You couldn't do two proposals in Bitcoin Core at the same time. Now with SegWit, ironically, we can make more of these pro soft fork proposals simultaneously, which is super interesting. Um, but um, the, the point of that was very, very, I think I had like my last tweet before everything went to shit, uh, like in the beginning of July and everybody stopped talking to each other and like, you know, let's, let's go. It was something like failing via BTC, via BTC, which was a, the proxy of Bitmain. It was a subsidiary of Bitmain. They were the ones that in, eventually became Bcash. Um, but via BTC said, let's fire Bitcoin core. And then I said something like, fuck you, <laughs> uh, let's fire you because you work for us and we're about to put you in your place. Um, and the conclusion of this thing is that it is undeniable that they worked for us because at the end of the day, um, we made them cave because it, what makes the minor revenue exist is the fact that people are buying their blocks and are um, uh, uh, agreeing with the miner that these are actually the rules of Bitcoin. Um, and then that wasn't the end though because Segwit2x is still scheduled for November 1st. So we got SegWit and then SegWit2x scheduled for November 1st. But honestly, after USF1, like the fight was not over, but it kind of was. Like everybody knew that just because you signed the fucking New York agreement doesn't mean you actually have to destroy Bitcoin. Right? So um, the big exchange is like the, the final exchange to like just put the nail in the coffin was Bitstamp. Bitstamp went ahead and said, no, we're not doing Segwit2x anymore. Um, BitGo, by the way, was the big company pushing for splitting Bitcoin. So BitGo also one of the traders. So Coinbase, BitPay, Blockchain Info, Shapeshift, BitGo, the five big traders of that, uh, uh, of, of that story, uh, the bad guys in the story, uh, with Jihan, obviously, but Jihan's like an obvious bad guy. These were like, he was never part of the team, I think. Uh, these were like part of the team and then they switched on the other side. Um, but uh, Segwit2x um, was, uh, we changed the UASF campaign to the No2x campaign. And new ASF was about, hey, you cannot block us from getting what we want because we are your client and we are paying for the blocks and we decide. That was UASF. And then No2x was, hey, you cannot change the recipe of the fucking burger you're, you're selling. Uh, like, USF is like, hey, I want you to... Uh, remove the ketchup from your burger, basically, or uh, something like that. Uh, whereas, uh, note, or, you know, uh, I want you to add this ingredient to your burger, and if you don't, uh, I'll just stop shopping at McDonald's. And the other one was, hey, like, McDonald's wants to change the burger to a vegan patty, for example, and then you say, well, you know, if you, uh, if you change your recipe to a vegan burger, then it's no longer a burger and we're not going to buy that shit. That was no 2 x um, So the first one is we wanted change and they were preventing it and we got our way. no 2 x was they want to change, we don't want to change, we got our way. So we got our way both times. Um, no 2 x was probably more important because if you want to fuck with Bitcoin, you're not going to prevent Bitcoin from growing. You're going to suggest changes to Bitcoin that fuck with Bitcoin because Bitcoin objectively now <clears throat> does not need any big upgrades. Taproot is a benefit, but we don't need a lot of upgrades. So if you're going to screw with Bitcoin, you're going to want to do something like No2x rather than UASF. Although in the Taproot example, which is, you know, one of the last big upgrades, I think this is going to happen, last big soft forks, um, people might want to prevent Taproot from happening because they don't want Bitcoin to succeed and they are, again, traders to Bitcoin. Um, so we might have to do, uh, you know, 
put the hats out of the bag. Um, so when that happened, I told my dad, like, dad, there's nothing that can stop Bitcoin anymore. Like now we can go see all of our friends and all our family. Like I was not sure about Bitcoin before UASF. After UASF, I was like, wow, not a fucking single shitcoin on earth could have mustered that. Not one stupid shitcoin could have pulled off UASF. Not one stupid shitcoin could have blocked No2x. Only Bitcoin can, because only Bitcoin had people that had this soul and skin in the game to like go down with the ship, right? So Bitcoin is unique in that sense. Like no one is gonna die for Dogecoin. Fuck that, that's, that's not like even Ethereum, bullshit. I don't believe that at all. That's it. Amazing Francis, as always, like really great insights. I, I think we can all thank you for being there and uh, being this warrior and uh, fighting for Bitcoin. So it's really a fascinating story. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's I, a bit I, long. It's a bit long for the meetup, uh, but Matchek, just so you know, I'm still down for some questions. I have time. Yeah, yeah. So I was about to say, so if anybody has a question or anything, actually, I have one. Um, yeah. I have one if I can. yeah, you can go. Hi, Joel. Uh, hi, Francis. Uh, what do you think about upgrading with a soft fork uh, Mimble Wimble protocol? It, it would be also maybe like Taproot or Graphroot, or do you think it is impossible to do that on the base layer? No, no, it's, it's impossible to do. It's like Mimble Wimble is completely different from Bitcoin. It's, it's, there, there's, it's just, you can't do it. You just can't, like, there's no blocks. There's no block, like, it's, it's just so different that it's just never going to happen. Mimble Wimble is not, it's not, Mimble Wimble could, could like be a side chain potentially at some point, um, but even then, uh, it, it could be maybe interesting as a side chain eventually, but uh, no, you, you just, even as a hard fork, you just can't. It's just, it's an altcoin. It needs to be an altcoin, unfortunately. Great. So maybe I, I'm going to ask my question. Uh, mm -hmm. Because you said that some people are going to go against Taproot. Are, are you seeing like parallels of like the same same situation happening with SegWit? Uh, because I, I feel like some people are starting to push it and some are saying again, like, oh, no, we're not ready yet. So what's your like bigger view on this? Um. The situation is very different now uh, because we th there's like unknowns that are you cannot bluff. For for example, the miners can't stop Taproot, so we know that. So the miners like they can't stop it. Um, I don't know. I don't see anyone who's who's stopping Taproot. I don't see any indication that anyone wants to stop it. But it was also the same case for SegWit, right? When SegWit was there, I guess maybe, I don't remember exactly how we felt, but I didn't feel at all like anybody was against it, like Taproot. Um, so I don't know why someone might want to, maybe they will try to stir up some shit to get another concession somehow, because you can't stop things like Taproot with the way that we're doing activation with BIP9 if like, if the users actually want it. Um, so it is very, very difficult to stop that route, I would say. Um, and I don't know why someone would. And in order to stop that route, you would need to basically convince people not to run it somehow, right? So the way that Bitmain and Jihan convinced people not to run UASF was by threatening a fork. But now we fucking know that if you fork Bitcoin, then it's the shitcoin, right? Back in the day, it was like, oh, let's we're gonna create Bitcoin too, and there's gonna be confusion as to whether or not which one is Bitcoin, right? So Bitmain will say Bitcoin is Bitcoin ABC, and Bitcoin Core is not Bitcoin. Um, and who knows which one was gonna be right, right? But if someone forks Bitcoin today and launches Bitcoin SV, for example, there's no doubt in anyone's mind that it's a shitcoin, right? So there's no, that threat is empty. So what 
threat can they can they impose on us? I don't know. Like we fucking nerfed all of their fucking threats. That's the craziest thing about USF. And it was so good that it happened early. And it's also so good that it happened with actual traders to Bitcoin, like Roger Ver, like um, Eric Voorhees, like uh, Stephen Pear. And there was all, all sorts of, of early Bitcoin OGs that were the trusted figureheads of Bitcoin. And it's like, you can only do that attack once and fail once. You can only fail once because once you fail once doing that attack, everyone knows it's a, it's a dud, right? It's a, it, if you try to fork Bitcoin with all of Silicon Valley, all of Wall Street and all the Chinese, like they had like 85% of the hash power, Segwit2x, even 90% of the hash power. And all of those failed because, and at the time Bitcoin was small enough that a small group of radicals was enough to tip the scales. Um, today, like, they, all of these attacks have been immunized against. Like, USF was the vaccine against those attacks. So now they need another kind of attack. And I don't know what attack they could do to block Taproot. Um, yeah, it would be... Uh, I, I don't know what they could do. We'll see. But... Uh, I, I think the threats are, the threats are all gone. The world so is clear. Should, so it shouldn't happen, but we should be ready if anything comes up. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. So any David. other question from uh, the audience? Hey. Hi, David. Yeah. Can I go? I have a question. Yes. Francis, thank you very much. I listened to every word. I loved it. Um, at the beginning, in the first uh, 15 minutes, you mentioned the coders who are coming in, the new generation, 40 or 50 or 60 new people. And you said they are replacing the, the, the 10 or 20 uh, people who were there before. If you don't mind, can you give me some insight how you see that happening on a human basis? How do they manage to replace the old coders? Yeah, well, um, they, they did, right? So um, if you look at the Bitcoin core development that I haven't looked recently, uh, maybe Magic, you can spot me a little bit here, but most of the Bitcoin core developers that I see are coming out of um, things that are not the original Blockstream people, which were back in the day, you had the non-Blockstreamers and the Blockstreamers. It was a very clear divide between the Blockstream guys and the, like, the Garzik and Andreessen gang. Um, now, like neither of those two groups are really contributing that much. Um, it's coming from a very, very wide variety of people. There's no, there is no real Bitcoin Core organization like there used to be. Like back in the day, Bitcoin Core was a much tighter group of little factions, and now it's just like a very, very, very open process. Um, no one that's a Bitcoin Core developer ever wants to be in that situation again. You have to really put yourself in the mind of a Bitcoin Core developer where all you want to do is write the best code in the world and now you're stuck in this international conflict with billions of dollars and essentially the future of mankind at stake. Because the future of Bitcoin is the future of mankind, right? So imagine being those developers, the, the insane amount of stress that's on you um, no one wants that to ever happen again. So the only, uh, I think the only thing I can say that's like, yeah, I mean, the dynamic is very different. I mean, I haven't touched, I haven't seen Bitcoin Core. Bitcoin Core is like no longer relevant. It's kind of like a very, very smooth process that's happening. And a lot of the innovation is anyways happening on different projects now all over the place. Um, the peer review process of Bitcoin Core is insanely long. Um, there is also an ideology in Bit, like the ideology of, of UASF is 100% now the ideology of Bitcoin Core developers, um, which is like very conservative. Uh, the, the Bitcoin Core, like I'd say the, the, the anti-forking mentality is, is the one that's now prevalent amongst the Bitcoin Core developers. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's not a lot of, uh, Chain Code Labs is probably the biggest contributor now. If you want to know like who's really pushing the stuff, I would say Chain Code Labs is probably the big group that's pushing it. And they were um, 
part of the UASF group. So let's just say that the, uh, the ideology of UASF, Note2x, Bitcoin Core, Cypherpunk um, became just dominant and accepted. And uh, now it's no longer really an issue at all. It's as if they had never existed, really, the previous gang. Hi, Francis. Hi, so much for the great presentation. I was wondering, uh, can you comment a little bit more about the uh, ASIC covered boost, which was the Jihan fraction running yeah. as miners and probably the true source of the, of the opposition to SegWit? Oh, yeah, thank you. I forgot completely. Very good point. Um, so ASIC boost. So what we're trying to understand, why does Bit, what does Bitmain have to gain by blocking SegWit? Because we were really trying to figure out, like, what's the deal here? Like, why? We understood that they wanted the bigger blocks, but you don't destroy Bitcoin because you don't get what you want, right? Like, you don't threaten to destroy Bitcoin because you don't get your 2x little block increase. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, uh, even financially, it doesn't make any sense. So there was always the, the, the thought that there was a secret incentive that we did not know. What I thought was the incentive was control over Bitcoin by the Chinese Communist Party, right? Or control over Bitcoin by whichever nefarious entity has found Jihan's child porn or whatever, you know? Someone has leverage over Jihan personally, or someone has leverage over Bitmain institutionally, like the Chinese Communist Party, for example, you know, genocidal maniacs, basically. Um, who knows what they can do to Jihan's family or whatever, who knows? So we're thinking like, why, why is Bitmain acting what we thought was irrationally, but we also know that they are not irrational, so there must be a reason why they're doing that. And it was discovered by, I think, Gregory Maxwell or some of the like OG crypto, like high level good Bitcoiners that uh, ASIC boost was discovered essentially, which was something inside of Bitmain's firmware that made them kind of more efficient at mining, but by kind of cheating a little bit, right? Not exactly cheating, but it was like cutting corners. So Bitmain had this code that allowed them to cut corners, which statistically speaking, gave them an edge over other people. And SegWit would not necessarily nullify it. It would kind of nullify it, but it would also reveal it for sure. So SegWit was fucking up their plans with ASIC boosts. Um, which was giving them like a good edge. I mean, it was something like 10%. Uh, I don't know if anybody has a number, but it was like a 10% increase in hash rate or in rewards, basically, because it wasn't increasing the hash rate. It was increasing 15%. Thanks, Julian. So it was 15% more rewards for the same hash rate. So cheating, kind of, but not really, because there's no rules in Bitcoin, really, other than the consensus rules. So if you can get away with it, and it's not good for the network, but, you know, what can we do? Um, so so uh, SegWit screwed with ASIC Boost, and then ultimately ASIC Boost was um, reverse engineered, if I'm not mistaken, and is now part of the uh, just most chips, I guess. Uh, I don't know if someone's following mining firmware or hardware, but uh, yeah, so that was, thanks Boris, like there was actually a reason why Bitmain was doing that all along. And ASIC boost was a big part of it. Um, although I don't think it was the bigger part of it. I think, I still think like the bigger part of it was control over Bitcoin. So, you know, think of, think, think of like what it takes to be the biggest Bitcoin company in the world and be heavily in China, like physically in China, not Shanghai or Hong Kong, like you're in fucking Beijing and the countryside. I'm still convinced that Jihan was telling his bosses at the CCP that he would control Bitcoin. And that was one of the conditions for him to operate like with impunity in China. Uh, that's still my theory. But ASIC boost, yeah, was, was one of them. Um, and slush, another cool thing is, but at, at that time also, um, the, uh, the uh, uh, Dragon Mint miners also came out, right? So the, uh, 
the non-Bitmain uh, mining machine came out. Specifically, this was, uh, by the way, Dragon Mint. Uh, I don't know if you guys know the Dragon Mints, but they initially, be, uh, it turned out it was, I believe, InnoSilicon who was making them the chip, but it was a UASF miner. <laughs> no joke. Like, the Dragon Mint project was basically all the USF people were like, okay, let's get together and make a fucking miner. And like, I was involved in helping um, do like uh, market research for Dragon Mint. And mo most of the people wearing this hat uh, had, you know, some degree. I had a very, very small, uh, just, you know, helping people um, do some biz dev and shit like that. But uh, that was one of the results also was this massive investment by cypherpunks into Bitcoin mining. Blockstream, obviously, as we know now, invested a lot of money in Bitcoin mining after UASF with their massive mine. Then uh, Slushpool, uh, which was a huge UASF, possibly the biggest company, the most imp important company in UASF, in my opinion, um, maybe with a few others. Um, they uh, did a lot of research on the Brains operating system, which allows the miner to choose his own rules without relying on the pool. Because that's how Jihan managed to use that leverage. Like Jihan had both the mining, um, infra like miner infrastructure himself, like the actual miner, but he was also running the pool, the Bitmain pool, the ant pool. Um, and if you're connecting to the best pool, which it was the best pool, you need to accept the rules of the pool. And after uh, UASF, Slush decided to focus on creating a new firmware. It's called Brains OS, the operating system for the miner, which allows the miner to choose his own rule regardless of what the pool is telling him. So with the new firmware, the pool doesn't decide anymore the rules. It is the actual miner. Um, because that was the problem, was that the miners could not decide. They would just go with whatever the pool was saying. And if it happens that the pool is also the person you're buying your hardware from, then, you know, you're going to do whatever the fuck they're telling you to do because they're like 100% of your suppliers are this one company. And if they cut you off, then there was no other miner that you could buy. Um, so the mining scene is also very different, which is why because Bitcoin was already decentralized, but the mining was still very centralized. And now it's much more decentralized. So... ASIC boost, big, big, big component. Um, and uh, yeah, but now ASIC boost again, it's, uh, I think ASIC boost is like available in the other miners. I don't know if anyone else knows more about ASIC boost, but I don't know if I said the right things about that, but that's what I remember from that. More questions. <laughs> Anybody got questions, comments? Okay. Well, Machek, I think uh, you want to start. Well, uh, I guess it's a wrap for today. And yeah. uh, thank you again for uh, giving us your time. And uh, yeah, fighting for Bitcoin again. So uh, the, 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 there's going to be a recording. So I will be publishing that on the Bitcoin Montreal uh, YouTube channel. So uh, for those who want to re-listen or send it to someone, uh, it's going to be available. So uh, thank you for everybody that attended, and uh, especially you, Francis. Thank you. Sounds good, guys. All right. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.